Hello, everyone, and welcome to my Let's Talk series where I share conversations with those who support international families navigate their life abroad successfully. Now, before we dive into today's topic, if you follow us live, please share your questions in the comments so that we can answer them live. And if you watch the recordings, you're very welcome to leave your comments and questions in the comment section, and we'll continue the discussion or the conversation there. So today I'm very happy to have uh, Magdalena Makovsky again as my guest, yeah. who wears many hats. She's translator, interpreter, she ran her own uh, language school, she's family language consultant and peach ambassador, and she is the author of the ebook Playful Bilingual Upbringing. Now, in our previous Let's Talk episode with Magdalena, we talked about raising multilinguals in a playful way. And we didn't get to talk about pretend play. So we decided to dedicate the second part to it. And uh, I think we could start actually today maybe briefly mentioning the advantages of play when transmitting a minority language to children. Yes. Um, so first of all, um, it makes everything more fun obviously and when children know that time dedicated to a minority language means having fun you just can't wait for it you know so um it's all about creating this positive atmosphere so that the language we want to transmit is associated um, with something pleasant sadly it's um usually the the total opposite of how we learn languages at school right um actually the only thing i remember from my english classes during the first year of primary school um is this buzz game i don't know if, if you're familiar with that yes maybe you can explain it <laughs> yes so we're asked to uh, count from one in sequence from pupil to pupil and when a number with um, i don't know seven i guess in it um for example right it can be if i will um i'm not sure if if children with yeah never mind um so if this number came up <laughs> uh, the pupil had to replace that number by shouting out buzz very simple game and it also taught some maths um so this is it positive thoughts feelings memories and uh, this excitement we just couldn't wait to to play this game after every lesson at least for a few minutes and mm -hmm. there's another advantage um, you can play and um plan and steer this uh, this this time so that your child is exposed to a certain type of language um let it be gardening vocabulary um making requests in a made-up shop, um, you can turn playtime into a very effective grammar lesson or vocabulary lesson. And in general, um, children experience and learn about the world through play. It's, it's a tool for their cognitive, physical, emotional, social development, but also imagination and creativity. Um, but I think we'll, we'll get to that later on. Yes, absolutely. And um, maybe you, you already mentioned a few examples now. And how can we, if we want to transmit the minority language now, right? We are talking about the children at home. You, you mentioned now a situation at school. When we are at home and we want to transmit uh, vocabulary or grammar to our children in our home languages, can you have, uh, give some examples about how we can teach grammar this way? So we are still talking about the playful way, right? Yes, yes. Um, when you're the one buying in, in a made-up shop and the child is the, the, the shop assistant, try asking for something that's not available in the shop. Um, in English, it's quite easy, I guess. We don't sell bananas, but in Polish, uh, all nouns are inflected for case um, with, with six possibilities. <laughs> Quite a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you ask for banana, and you're not in. The, they're not in the shop. So the child needs to to use a different case. Bananov. Mm -hmm. Fun fact: um, My husband, who has been living in Germany since early childhood, um, he sometimes forgets 
that a negative in Polish changes the inflection. And so once we were going shopping and he said, there's no bread with a mistake, nie ma chleb. And our two-year-old daughter corrected him by saying nie ma chleba. So it's, it's really, it's really amazing that um, how, how early on a child can, can pick up a nuance like that. Mm. And also studies have shown that children who engage in pretend play, they use more subjunctives, um, more future tenses and ad adjectives. So it's not only me, I guess, um, who thinks that, that grammar also benefits from this kind of play. Yes, especially because you go through um, many different scenarios and uh, we're going to talk about this in a moment, I think. But um, another question that comes up when we are transmitting a minority language in a setting where this minority language is not supported, uh, we also have to do with, with culture, right? So especially mm -hmm. when not surrounded by these kind of cultural references, the pretend play can be a great solution. Shall we just list a few of these ideas? I mean, I, I think we never get, yeah, <laughs> we, we have a lot. So let's just mention a few. Um, yeah, when it comes to cultural references, um, it's springtime. Uh, well, you can't see it really now outside because it's it's snowing right now. Out of the window, but it's spring right now. And um, white storks, the birds, are flying back to Poland and other European countries. Um, but you won't see them, for example, in the UK or Scandinavian countries. And so um, you can pretend with your child that you are storks, taking this long, elegant steps and opening wide the beaks, red beaks. Um, and of course, saying clack, 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 clack from time to time. Um, I guarantee that the little one will, will remember uh, what botian is, even if they've never actually seen one. Okay, yes, absolutely. I was talking yesterday with someone and uh, she was from Peru and she said, well, we can, we, if we talk about animals, for example, as you were talking about animals at llamas in, in Peru, you have so many different names for them and so many different species of llamas. It's not only llama, stop, but many, many more. So in these um, pretend play situations, we can include them. Maybe if we, if we don't have these animals around us, like you just mentioned, um, with pictures it can be done or with videos or whatever. So uh, to include them in some way or maybe you have even a, a puppet that that has this this size or this uh, this um, shape what else yes i think we've already mentioned uh, last time the fact that um things that resemble real um objects uh are remembered better than for example yeah. pictures right pictures. so yes yeah so so i think this is also important um, there also has been this study, um, and it, it has um, shown that um, children actually like to um, engage in something that is real. So, for example, if they have um, a pony, a real pony to ride on, they would rather do that instead of pretending to ride a pony. I think this is obvious. <laughs> Who wouldn't like to ride a pony? Um, but yes, but the, the more real we get, the better. Yes, there is one comment from someone on Facebook. Hello, Uta. Ask here, what kind of games can we play with children to build grammar and language acquisition? I think we, we mentioned it before, but we are uh, now continuing with, with examples. But maybe we can quickly um, repeat an answer that actually covers both that we are talking about now. Uh, yes, uh, what was it again? <laughs> that was this question that we have on the screen and to say how, what kind of games can we play with children to build grammar and language acquisition? So when they are very, very young. Yeah, I think it also uh, depends on the language, obviously. So as I said, Polish is uh, quite complicated when it comes to grammar. Um, so it's actually very hard not to practice grammar <laughs> when you play. Um, 
also, um, let's say with the adjectives, right? Um, there's another um, suffix for feminine, another suffix for masculine, and so on. Um, so even when you play with uh, simple objects with colors, uh, and you name those objects, um, then you, you still are practicing grammar. So I think it, it really depends on, on the language. You need to take into consideration what the, the, the grammar of the language is and then uh, adjust uh, the play to that. Yes, yes, absolutely. And what comes to mind um, is also, for example, if the, the language is Italian and you have the congiuntivo, yeah? <laughs> that it, with, uh, with the congiuntivo you can express doubt you're making the example before with a banana that is not in the shop, yeah? Yes. Uh, e, e se volessi una banana, e se ci fosse una banana, or e, e cosa succederebbe se, etc. You can in, introduce this a uh, little bit more complicated form that you might not introduce to, to three-year-olds. I'm, I'm perfectly aware of that. I'm now thinking about uh, maybe eight-year-old children because I think we, we can think about this pretend play not only for very young children but also for older children especially when we are uh, transmitting a minority language or an additional language at home so these settings can vary across languages across age groups etc yeah. mm -hmm. i also um now that i uh, think of it in very small children they they usually start uh, creating sentences in the third person right so so they say um, Magda goes somewhere and so on and so on um, so to teach them to or encourage them to to use the first person we can play with with a toy with a doll with something that would say the words and mm -hmm. uh, in this way it's it's more probable that the child will somehow you know get the idea and and we'll start using the the first person yes absolutely if the if the third if the toy or the third person maybe it's also child that is introduced in the play says magda can you give me a glass of water and the the child is magda it would be you now because it's your name it's a bit weird. but um and she would say yes magda can and then you can say oh i do no i want so you in include or you reiterate the i i to say no no it's me Ute, who wants to give you the glass of water and then in a playful way the child will also say no i i i i i without even thinking about it right yes. because this yes. is a way that we want to them also to understand the patterns and the the rules that are maybe taught much later and realized much later but in a in a most natural and playful way with our little ones great um so what we were saying before is actually or what we briefly mentioned before is that this pretend play allows us to explore a variety of situations we mentioned a few and that have educational purposes. They can have educational purposes. I'm always a bit careful of saying what we do at home needs to be educational because, I mean, it's a Saturday. We want to have some time <laughs> off, but we want to have fun. But we want also to have this fun time with our children to be uh, somehow productive or to be richer because maybe it is really only a limited time that we have in the weekend to focus on those languages. So. And we can also focus on social skills. Shall we mention a few of them? Yes. Um, I actually think that um, those social skills, um, this might even be the most significant purpose, uh, considering the difficult times we, we live, live in right now. Um, we've talked um, a bit about it last time. Um, during the, the pandemic, many children couldn't or still can't play with their friends and classmates and we know it's um it's important for their development children need to interact with other people so pretend play or role play um it's a way of introducing various real life situations to ch children um, also when they pretend to be someone else or use objects in a specific way and they observe the results of their actions they're really experimenting with social interactions and emotions they develop empathy um, seeing what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes they learn how to cooperate 
divide tasks and, and share responsibility. Mm -hmm. See, even before they start playing, they need to agree on the topic, they need to assign roles, they need to come up uh, with some rules. I mean, this is just amazing, right? It mm -hmm. couldn't get better. No, it couldn't. And uh, I must say that, I mean, I know that when my when my son was the only child I had, so he was very young, he would imagine speaking, talking with his toys and assigning to the toys some roles. And he would pretend uh, answer them. Yeah. So maybe a toy would be maybe something that he processed uh, or he experienced during the day and he was processing through the pretend play. Uh, and he was then responding to this other person. And it might have been that in the real world, so in the real situation that he experienced right before, he didn't come up with the right response. So I think this, this pretend plays um, allows also to explore a variety of situations that we had struggled with before and that we can actually solve. For example, if they were uh, playing in the sand pit and they, they want to have um, some, some toys from the other child, the child is not giving them to them, and then they go home frustrated and they reenact this play, they, this pretend play, and then comes the solution. And it helps them to be maybe prepared the next time and to have the sentence ready. I observed this in my son when he was the, the only child. And then I observed it also in my three children when they were coming back from school or the play uh, playground or uh, the preschool, when they were reenacting real situations that they went through during the day. and then be in the role of the other person or again in their own role depending on what they wanted to focus on yeah. which is for me it was an eye-opener it was for me very interesting to see what they were going through and i could know okay today they had a fight with <laughs> anna or uh, their friend kevin fell and hurt his leg and he's um you mentioned empathy and he's uh, preoccupied and he's worried about how he's doing so this this pretend play confronts the children with the thoughts the opinions and the feelings of others like you mentioned before so it is more than learning more about the language it's also learning more about how to express and how to feel the feelings or the emotions yes yes it's it's actually called theory of mind so children become aware that other people might think and feel different. They become capable of seeing another perspective. And it, it makes sense when you think of it. They, they have a go at being someone else, right? And, and thanks to this experiment, let's say, uh, they understand others' emotions better. And pretend play can also be therapeutic. Um, children learn how to deal with negative emotions and how to control their, their impulses, which in turn can reduce overall aggression. So um, it's a form of self-regulation, really. Now, again, when it comes to the pandemic, in some daycare facilities, children were encouraged to, to play with, with the virus, so to say. Um, for example, they, they touched paint and they saw how it stayed on everything they touched and this showed them the importance of, of washing hands and that they can feel safer if they remember to do so um, it's similar when children pretend to, to visit the doctor they have a chance to experience it let's say and find suitable reactions so it's not that scary when they go there in the end Yes, absolutely. Yes, it's uh, it's practically like um, staging a situation that might be scary and going through the different um, stages of the situation. So you walk into the doctor's office and you are going to sit on the chair or he's going to, to do this and that. And, and yeah, the different steps that we go through, we can actually visualize them beforehand through pretend play. There is a comment from um, from someone on, on Facebook. 
how can we use language through playing specifically to teach feelings? And I think you, you just answered it. So that we, we go through them and we name the things in our language or the language that the child needs. Now, we were talking about minority language and we ma were making now the example with um, the visit of a doctor or uh, in, the, in the daycare. And there is maybe the other language that is needed. So we can actually also yes, switch the language depending on what the child needs in that given situation, right? So we, we are not only, we are, we are raising multilinguals, so uh, they need to be, be able to function and to have this vocabulary in all of their languages depending on the situation, absolutely. Yes, so we are mentioning now how, how they, the pretend play can confront or does confront children with their thoughts, opinion, and feelings of others as well. So they can step into the shoes of the father, maybe, or the mother, <laughs> and, uh, and then, yes, uh, processes during this play. Some children engage in the pretend play more often than others. I mean, not all children like maybe to play pretend play or don't play it as often. Do we know why this is? Or do you have an answer to this? Mm -hmm. um, there's been research on the topic to, to find out what promotes early and frequent imaginative play. And it turns out that parents who regularly talk to their children and at the same time explain um, some social issues or nature features, but also those who read or tell stories at bedtime, these parents are most likely to foster pretend play. Now, some teachers um, use pretend play to teach math or reading. Um, for example, with this um, made up shop situation, right? You, you can count things, you can ask for um, two liters of milk, um, you can count money. So this is maths. And um, here again, when, when this is encouraged or even just tolerated, then preschoolers and early age, um, early school ages um, seem to be more imaginative and, and curious and seem, simply learn better this way. There's also been this interesting research um, with clearly creative individuals like uh, Nobel Prize winners. And it looks like these people engaged more often in early childhood games about make-believe worlds than others in their fields. So imaginative play is associated with, with increased creativeness, which is really nice, I think. Yes, with uh, more creativity because you imagine yourself in this other world, in this other situation, and you can get to explore it. It is a little bit like uh, reading a book or inventing a book or a story, right? It's uh, pretend inventing a story or pretend play is very, very similar to that uh, with these regards. Very good. And um, now what would then be, you, you now mentioned the advantages of it, but what would be possible disadvantages? Is it possible that children start, for example, confusing what is real and what is not made up? Uh, yeah. Of course, we're talking now about the very young children. If we are inviting them to do pretend play, is there a, a, a too early to just to, to play pretend play with children i think that um some say that it's um, it starts with the six months old children um but it does sound terrifying right if uh, if our children started confusing what's real and what's not um so let's take the classic banana as telephone scenario um, a toddler picks up a banana, puts it to his ear and says, ring, ring. Um, as far as we know, um, thanks to research, of course, uh, children don't generally confuse pretense with reality, at least by age uh, four, but probably even younger, children are able to say that what happens during a pretend game isn't real. They also don't believe that pretend play influences the way things are in reality. So children playing the banana telephone game, they don't end up thinking that you can communicate with a banana or that you can eat a telephone, right? Um, yeah. It's the same with, with taking care of a doll as if it was a baby. 
And still, sometimes um, children may react to a pretend event um, as if it was real. For example, when they are genuinely afraid of a monster under the bed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not because they're confusing pretend play with reality. It's got more to do with, with their fears in general. Yes, and I think uh, that that's a very important uh, topic that you mentioned here, this this monster under the bed or or any kind of fear that our children have that through play we can help them to to find ways to cope with it or to make an understanding of it. But I would like to chime in with a little warning, so to say, when our children are really very much afraid and they have been through traumatic situations, sometimes we parents are not enough to help them, right? And I know that uh, child psychologists also use the pretend play. It's, it's a part of a therapy <laughs> that has to do with uh, children then going through very difficult situations but in an environment where there is a professional who can help and sometimes we parents are not the professional so this is a little warning for those who are going through through very difficult times or where maybe we parents see we might need more help so this is just a, a little call don't be afraid to also ask maybe a child psychologist and let your child play with them and to see what, what can be done. But this is just a yeah. side. We are trying now to focus maybe on But, on but it's really fun. important, uh, you know, even considering, um, again, our situation in the world right now uh, with so yeah. many children losing their home um, and starting life. From the beginning so it's it, it is really important to provide this professional help to those children yes absolutely to provide professional help but to provide them also a little bit uh, um, a space where they can express their fears through maybe the pretend play that can be one of the the things but it's something where we can allow them to express themselves but if we see that they need more support to to really get and appoint someone who is professional about this and who can really help the child if needed so now we were saying mm, pretend play can be played with children from six months onwards up to 99 100 i would say yes. <laughs> and uh, now we were talking about assisting or not assisting the pretend play i mentioned that i watched my children i didn't even ask them to or didn't invite them to play uh, pretend play or role plays should we assist in pretend play or is it enough to give some role play material or let children do their thing what is your experience or or what you you have uh, read about this topic extensively so this is a great question. I, I guess we'd like to think that providing the material um, is more than enough. Um, quite recent research, it was published uh, at the end of uh, 2020, I guess, um, it showed that providing role play material increases the frequency of pretend play in um, preschoolers. So that's good news. But if we want to foster social pretend play quality, the support of adults during the play is actually more important. Um, what they also found was that by adding new play materials, we may trigger the need in children to explore them and so awaken their interest in playing. All in all, um, we need to, to keep the balance between the self-initiated joyful play and giving children active play support. Mm -hmm. So practically, it is a little bit like, like we mentioned another time, we, we observe our child, we take a step back and see whether it is needed to uh, intervene or to, to help them, to assist them, to provide material, or if they have maybe enough material around them, or they might even choose not to, to play, pretend play in that moment. But... Um, Talking about the play or the playing in, in general now, what about the the free play? Yeah, we have also the, the option of free play. Children need to interact with their peers and independent play has its benefits, as you mentioned before. Now we were talking about 
uh, pretend play with materials, what about free play? Mm -hmm. True. Um, we should let children play alone or independently from time to time because when, when they play by themselves, they can be more creative. They, they use their imagination uh, and their being independent, which, which is beneficial later in life. It's also important for, for developing um, problem solving skills. Mm, children also need to, to express their own way of thinking in free play. And these skills flourish when children play ind independently. So yes, we should sometimes take a step back and just let them do their thing. Yes, and uh, you mentioned, yes, at school, these uh, situations are very off guided and it, it makes sense. I mean, you have a certain schedule and you know that you have only a, a limited time to spend with the children and you want them to learn certain skills. So it has an educational background or reason. So, but generally speaking, do you think that the free play is becoming an endangered species, species or practice? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nowadays parents are, and educators they are given lots of educational aids. I mean, aids. Um, they're tempted to, to buy, for example, educational toys, uh, download educational apps, sign up the children for educational activities. It's all over, right? Um, some parents may even send the children to a boot camp to prepare them for kindergarten. Yeah. I really like what, what Tracy wrote on her Raised Good blog. You sent me an article. Um, um, it was, what was this? Taking away a child's ability to play is like taking away their voice. Mm -hmm. And in fact, play is considered so important to, to child development that it's been recognized by the United Nations as a basic right of every child. Uh, yes. I think we need to um, also underline that. And, you know, children used to, to build forts, um, climb trees, collect bruises. Sometimes things even got a bit bloody. Um, but they were having the time of their lives. And we should remember um, what childhood really is and, and let our children have that as well. <laughs> so you you just mentioned something it can be become also a little bit bloody and there I said oh there are many many parents who it's what <laughs> I don't want my child to get injured or something and um, I remember well it of course it depends on where we are raising our children and the way we are raising our children and what kind of context we are raising our children but there are huge differences among the cultures and the ways to do this. So there are some, some ways. I remember a friend of mine in Germany saying that her four-year-old was, uh, was playing with, uh, with a knife and, and uh, with the woods in the, yes, in the woods. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's something, playing with a knife mm -hmm. when you're four-year-old and you have other 20 children around. In other settings, one would just fear that something worse could happen, that something terrible could happen. So when you say bloody, it's not you need to go to for, to emergency room or something. But it's just yeah. there are some bruises. Yeah, when you fall, I, I prefer thinking maybe, OK, when they fall, they get up and they they run ahead or, or walk yeah. ahead so, so that you yeah. make this. this <laughs> yes, exactly. I would just want to <laughs> I had a picture in my mind. Maybe it's only my mind. Mind. I have a terrible one maybe at this point, but when someone says bloody, but um, <laughs> but I like this this free play and and what you mentioned, especially the the fewer toys that children have, um, and I think we all experience this. I also remember that when my children were younger and I was sleep deprived and I knew that they had fifty times more energy than I had that I was very happy to have toys, to have some other things that I didn't have to, to be in the middle and to, to help them play or to, to go out even in the playground sometimes was a lot of energy with three children and two running in two directions, the third one climbing the tree and uh, yeah, you know, you have the picture. So, but still we can say that fewer toys, and I must say at some point when they got older, 
I eliminated the toys. I always put them away in a box. And if after, I don't know, a month they didn't ask for it, I just donated them or gave mm -hmm. them to friends. So that was my procedure. And uh, I think uh, hindsight, I, I wouldn't have needed all these toys, but sometimes you get them also as presents. But fewer toys kids have, the more they play. That is true, right? Yeah. Yeah, we also have actually everything um, either in boxes, I mean, like um, building blocks and so on. Um, and then the only thing that is reachable, let's say, that your eyes can see uh, are the books um, and um, crayons, uh, some pencils and pieces of paper, um, some printouts. Uh, so this is something that she can just take because she sees it and also, uh, you know, puzzles, stuff like that. But uh, yeah, with, with um, most of the toys, I try to keep them out of sight so that um, they're not uh, distracting. That's, that's the thing. Yeah, because it, it's so true, you know. Um, I had the chance to see it at our Polish meetup some time ago. Mm -hmm we we were getting ready to to go home already and we cleaned up um, put away all the toys and suddenly children started playing together you know running around taking turns to slide um grabbing each other by hands it was so nice to watch them when they had toys um they played alone or, or wanted their parents to play with them so toys were actually a distraction for their imagination and creativity. So yeah, it's this is the thing with toys. Yes, well, toys, the way that you describe it now, if uh, they were somehow a means to connect maybe with others and to, to explore them with others, whereas when the toys are not there, are not at their disposal, they have to come up with something and they actually then realize that they have a lot of imagination that they can uh, work with. And uh, I would like to add another thing as we are talking about pretend play and uh, less toys at home. Um, what I did, and I know many parents do this when you are in the kitchen, for example, and we, we all need to eat and we prepare meals, etc. But the kitchen is also one of the places where it can become bloody. I'm sorry, I'm getting back to this kind of <laughs> image in my head. Um, but what we can do or what can be helpful is to have a drawer or, or something where our children can access uh, things out of uh, wood or plastic or if you want to avoid plastic something else that is not breakable and where they can also prepare some food right imaginary food or where they can cut with uh, a knife that is not too sharp <laughs> so we don't have a, a bad surprise and where they can prepare something like a salad or or wash something like uh, the salad or or anything else or prepare the carrots if you want or, or anything else so that is a sort of pretend play but actually a realistic pretend play yeah. that has also the purpose to to help mom or dad whoever is in the kitchen preparing the meal for example just to make an example the same also for uh, when you are repairing something at home and uh, your child wants to help you or the other person that they have a little hammer that is maybe not as big and as as dangerous as a normal one, but they can also or a screwdriver. I remember that I've, I'm just calling this this uh, Swedish um, brand, right? Where you have to build your own furniture. Yeah. Our children helped from the beginning. It was so funny to see that they could read the instructions and they could say, now you have to put this one to that one and screw and whatever it was. So it is not really pretend play, it's realistic or reality play maybe in some way, but pretend play is always also reflecting part of the reality that they are exposed to. Yeah. So how can we actually then encourage free play at home? Oh, nowadays we have so many possibilities you know we can we can buy those um those vegetables and fruits that you can cut in half because they are already in halves um there's just a magnet or something that keeps them together and it's so easy you know to to cut them that's how children learn to cut um 
so many possibilities on the internet to buy to buy those things um but first um, yeah if we want to to give our children the chance to, to explore and do most things on their own um so that you know they can build in the independence and confidence um, i would make sure uh, there's a safe space for that so again coming back to to this uh safety issue um then help create an environment to to pursue your child's interest um, ask what they'd like to to play today and provide them some materials when the little one is already playing don't disappear but also don't interrupt too much uh, again we need to find this you know compromise um, and give some clues and support but don't do everything for the child. Um, ask things like, um, what would you like to do? Do you need help? Um, how can we solve this problem? And then guide your child towards a solution. And finally, um, make sure this is also bonding time. Um, even if, if you ask the child to do something independently, say, um, write a story or draw a house, just to have, you know, these three minutes for yourself. Um, remember to later engage yourself as well. So um, listen to the story or compliment on the drawing. The thing is, um, I know I wrote Playful Budding while well, upbringing with ideas on how to spend time with your child, but um, I'm sure you, you know how to do that. If you just stop and think for a second, um, pretend play is, is great because you just need your imagination, right? And the rest will, will get sorted on the way, so to say. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it is maybe now we're coming back to, to what you said at the beginning or at some, some point also during the last, last uh, 30 ish minutes, a bit more, is to, to find this balance between Yes, guiding somehow, if you see that the child might benefit of having some pretend play, especially if it is about um, making processing or naming new things like feelings, yeah, or empathizing uh, with a friend or an, another person in the family or, or in the neighborhood or wherever, so that sometimes we can guide it, we can just give, give a little hint and then see how the child reacts, if it's the right moment and if the child really wants that and if the child finds maybe the different tools that are necessary to, to do this pretend play. And something that we didn't uh, emphasize very much is this pretend play with a, a child that is the only child and the pretend play with uh, more than one child at home mm -hmm. uh, across year groups, yes, across ages, yeah. where maybe there is one lead the, the younger or the older child and then you have practically also the social skills that you mentioned before that can be the let me come back to together <laughs> on screen that where you can uh, maybe foster also something like um, social dynamics within the family mm -hmm. or within a, a group uh, either at school or in the community where then the child might take the um, the role of the adult and the adult the role of the child which is very very yeah. funny to see or where the big brother can do as if he was a baby and the other sister could be the the oldest child whereas she's always the middle one or even the youngest one so in this with this regard then showing them or or letting them experience what it is to be the old brother or the the older siblings sibling who might always be in charge or feel like some more responsibility or not it can also be that it's uh, actually the other child in the family that does um so there is another question about empathy from someone on facebook it's um is there a way we can teach self-empathy through playing and teaching language so we are talking language now again and self-empathy. So that mm -hmm. would be probably being aware of your own feelings, right? If I understand mm -hmm. it right. Yeah, I think I think this is it. Yeah. Um, yes, I think that um, in general, 
um, it's also about creating this safe space, let's say, a uh, safe space for, for a child to really um, show the emotions. You know, it's um, it's really about about this uh, um, this moment when a child knows that what we say now this will be said right here right now uh, only between us and i can deal with it you will help me deal with it and they will, will move on and and i will um i will benefit from from this support i think this is important that the child knows it um it's the same with you know and any other um, any other professional setting also with with psychiatrists and so on um, so yeah, for, for a child to really open up about the emotions, uh, we need to not only create this um, interesting setting of, of the game we can play, but also uh, when it comes to, to this um, safe space. Yes, and I would like to, to re-bring this question because when we talk about language also, the fact is that um, sometimes when our children go, for example, to a daycare very early on and they, they get the words, yeah, the, the terms in the daycare or the community language, if it's the same one, but they might not use the same terms also in our home languages. So maybe we say, oh, you're sad or you're angry and you're happy. Yes, these three. But there are so many other ways to express it. And sometimes they, they can express their feelings and emotions more in the other language. And so I think in this, these uh, pretend play situations, or when we when we focus on empathy in that pretend play, we can we were talking about before have different toys, different puppets, or or whatever it is, and say, oh, this is sad, this is uh, very angry, or this is frustrated, or this is uh, uh, struggling with, so that we can give the language that we actually use at home, um, and the terms that we might not use that that often and this gives us through the pretend play the opportunity to explore a broader vocabulary that our children might need to actually um, name the the self-empathy that uh, is mm -hmm. uh, taking place so i'm i'm sad but i'm also hurt and i'm angry and frustrated and what can i do with that so that you can actually explore this in your given language and it's it's very difficult sometimes if you have a language or language combinations where you have terms that are, are very similar but are used in different ways and have yeah. another semantic uh, power or or uh, weight or mm -hmm. oh, there's a weight in another language Yes, absolutely. So, so maybe in one language you would say angry, and then the other one you would say uh, frustrated, or or something else, or with with other words, with other adjectives and and adverbs even. Yeah. So that is is a very very powerful way, I think. But it's one of the the aspects where pretend play can be very helpful to explore the the home yeah. language environment. And where we parents get also to realize where our children need more support with, because they might be yes. able to name all the toys, but not not what is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And when we see that they are struggling, um, or maybe they uh, they are not sure how to how to express their emotions, um, we can use this toy and and um, yeah, say that oh look what happened to Teddy. Teddy uh, has just uh, lost his ice cream, right? And and now he's he's feeling sad. He misses his ice cream and so on, right? So this is uh, this is this is a way to to um, not only help them understand what they're feeling and why they're feeling it and how they can deal with it, but also to to teach them. Uh, necessary vocabulary to to express that yes and i would like to add something we were talking now mainly about uh, maybe preschool children and primary school children let's think about it's maybe not exactly pretend play situation but uh, with our teenagers or preteens uh, this giving them a task where they are 
I'm just thinking we are we're in the car the GPS is not working or we make it not work and we ask our, our child that's ne sitting next to us if they are tall enough of course mm -hmm. um, we ask them to please guide us through the city or through wherever we are going and they have to they can use either a very old card <laughs> a map or they they use their their um, the map on an electronic device for example but without letting them mm -hmm. guide through the Google map, for example, but they have to find their own way. This is also a, a way to maybe explore the vocabulary. So, mm -hmm. die zweite Straße rechts und an der Ampel links, like that in German, or also to step in the shoes of someone who is driving, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, you have to take care of so many different things and you have also to find your way and follow some kind of directions or have them in your head. Whereas if you're sitting next to the driver, you never really realize what is going on and what the driver has to do. And I think this happens to many parents when you are driving or when you are on the bike or wherever you are in the traffic, that your child is telling you stories and asking you things and you are actually doing five, six, seven different things at the same time because you're taking care that there is no accident you take care of all the surroundings you try not to lose yourself in traffic mm -hmm. and you respond to the children which is a lot yeah <laughs> but so this might not be exactly role play but it has to do with a little bit what we are talking about now in the past uh, few minutes about empathy um, developing empathy and saying, okay, now you look uh, on, take care of the street and of the traffic that is my maybe heavy, and I will tell you where you can turn. This mm -hmm. is something that I did uh, very early on when I was a child. I was uh, the the co-pilot of my my father, for example, and I'm doing the same with my children as well. And I see that it's it's quite beneficial also to have this bond then again. And we are coming yeah. back to what you said at the beginning that this pretend play, if we are involved, but also if we're not involved, can also be a moment to bond with our children. Absolutely. Yeah. I also think it's it's really important to, uh, from time to time, give your child a chance to be the expert on something. Um, so um, even if, if it's not like, I don't know, if your child does not, uh, is not interested in I don't know, dinosaurs yet, um, this would be great, right? Because then uh, the child could teach you something about stegosaurus and so on and yes. so on, right? Uh, and you listen carefully, you take notes, and you're like, oh, you know so much. Like, this is amazing. Um, but also, uh, when it comes to language, um, sometimes uh, try to make a mistake and let your child correct you. So um, give your child a chance to be the better one, the one that knows the right answer, the one that, that will tell you, um, that's not the way you should be, you should say this and that. Um, it might be silly. Again, um, let's make things silly. <laughs> don't be, don't be so, uh, so, so serious all the time. Do something silly, say something silly, and, and then uh, your child will be like, oh, no, mom. The tomatoes don't grow on trees uh, so yeah uh, just yeah let it go for a second and, and be silly and it is in fact um, an amazing opportunity for us adults also to to be silly and to be in the shoes of of someone who doesn't know all and we don't know all <laughs> that that's just a fact but that would be um, an opportunity for us to to show our children that they can teach us a lot as well and to be open to that even in our language and even in uh, when we might think that we know everything about our language but our children might actually also teach us a lot about uh, how they process the language and how they access the language and use it in their very own way which doesn't need to be the wrong way there is no wrong way there are just a different way <laughs> yeah. but uh, I personally like this role play uh, and to be silly every now and then and and to really have fun and engage in these different roles that can be exactly what we said before the one who doesn't know or the one who is younger or the one that for once the child is taking care of us 
which at some point maybe in life will happen when we are really old and our children are adults. So these are all pretend play, but uh, they are in effect uh, reflecting real situations that can happen all the time. So I would like to invite our, our followers to maybe ask the last questions because we are very close to, to the hour. <laughs> if you have any further questions or would you like to add something, uh, Magdalena, to round it up before we... Oh, yes, there is someone. Maybe, sorry, <laughs> I don't like to interrupt, but yes, sometimes when the word in my language does not come to mind straight away, I ask my sons. They love it when they can remember it before me. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's that's something that I also do sometimes. And, uh, mm -hmm. when, and I must say that I don't even have to fake it. Sometimes it really happens where I... <laughs> I just can't remember the name or yeah. the, the concept or the term. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry, Magdalena. Yeah, yeah um, with making those mistakes, um, it's also um, good when we want to check if the child um, hears the difference between sounds. Uh, so if you say, for example, oh, look, what a really tall tree, not mm -hmm. tree and then see if they if they can hear the, the sound difference. Um, you can also do that with, I'm, I'm still thinking in Polish, so it's like, you know, uh, this is a huge wardrobe, szafa uh, and szafa, you know, szafa is the, the right sound, szafa mm -hmm. is what children say. Um, and uh, at some point they should start using the sh sound. Uh, so this is also a way to, to see if they can differentiate between uh, sounds, yeah. Yes, if they hear the difference, right? Yeah, yeah. Especially when they, when they are exposed to multiple languages, they might not hear the difference in one language, but they hear it in the other, or because it's not important in the other language, so I have to correct mm -hmm. myself. Um, and it's a way to to tune their hearing and their understanding of the sounds, the words uh, used in that target language that we want to foster uh, to make these kind of games and, and to engage in these kind of role plays. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Magdalena, for coming back <laughs> and uh, for, for talking about pretend play that somehow it got lost the last time, but I think yeah, we... There is... I'm glad actually we, we uh, dedicated the whole episode to that because it's really um it's one of the easiest ways of spending time with your child and it's so beneficial that that it's really uh should should be like routine so yeah yes and it's it's beneficial and it's fun also for us parents i really like it <laughs> yeah. so well thank you herzlichen dank the last time i said thank you in in polish and i say, I say it in german for for okay, taking the time it's my time in publish so there is much more that we could add but i'm i'm very happy to continue maybe the conversation in the in the chats and the comments on youtube and or on facebook preferably on youtube so we know where to where to look at so please let us know if you if you're following us now live and you would like to add a question maybe in an hour or so please feel free to do so and if you are watching this as a recording please do the same we are here we are going to check all the comments every now and then and uh, very happy to continue the the conversation so Thank you very much, Magdalena, again. Thank you, everyone, who took the time this morning. Here for me, it's morning in the Netherlands, morning in uh, in Germany for Magdalena as well. Um, I wish you, every, everyone, uh, a lovely weekend. And uh, until the next time, on Let's Talk with, uh, with Me. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.